God, um, you want to use for your glory. And God, we don't, we don't always like that. Um, we don't like challenges that come our way. Um, and God, all of us would like peaceful, non-complicated lives. And God, the truth of it is, none of us lead those. And um, God, this time that we're on earth um, is a time where you walk with us. And God, just as we see with Paul, even in this story, that you stand right next to us and tell us to be of good courage. So God, you know the hurts and you know all that's going on in this room and um, the challenges that we all face. And God, I just pray that the women will see, irregardless of um, what's swirling around them, that you are standing next to them and you are with them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so let's look at um, chapter 21, and I did terrible on my slides last night. I literally got to the second slide on the map and then just stopped the rest of the lesson. So I'll try to do better today. Um, Acts part two, and you'll see that each week I'm trying to add the next chapters in there um, for you, and those are just those titles that can go um, on the top of your observation worksheet and if you so want it you also can fill out your at a glance chart but the most important thing is to put them at the top of those observation worksheets so um, if you have something else there that you like better that will help you remember what is in that chapter then you can just leave it there and just to give you an idea of where we are again um, on this the sequence of events after Paul's conversion and we're gonna hear we we're gonna read a passage of scripture that I'm gonna read really fast pretty much tonight today because we've already looked at it pretty in depth when we were looking at Paul's Damascus Road experience we went forward and looked at this passage in Acts because it's really Paul in his own words talking about what happened on that Damascus road. So we'll kind of read through that quickly. Um, but just so that you know where we are, we're about 56 AD. Paul has just finished his third missionary journey. And if you remember, we left him trying to get back to um, Jerusalem. And he was stopping at those different places. And the one last place he stopped that we covered last week was that Miletus. And it was in Miletus that he called those Ephesian elders to come down. And he taught on elders and the importance of watching for false teachers coming in. And so we've seen over and over again um, Paul's heart for the local church and um, how incorrect I was in my feeling that Paul was just a bull, just an evangelistic bull. It, that's who I would have said Paul was. I, like my mama would say, a bull in a china shop who would just go and all he cared about was evangelism. Mm. And we've really seen a different Paul, at least I have. Maybe you all had a much better idea. But um, we've seen someone who cares deeply for these local churches that he leaves and that he he collects these people and travels with them um, to help the church and to help grow them and so it's been um, so exciting to walk with him and get to know him um, so well and we saw if you were to look at what books he's written at this point we know he wrote Galatians first. Remember, he wrote that after the Jerusalem Council to all the churches up there in that Galatia area, explaining to them how um, what they needed to do, that they didn't have to follow the law exactly. Um, then we saw, as he continued, he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. And remember, Thessalonica was someplace he couldn't stay a long time because the Jews were super um, after him there. They even followed him to Berea. Um, and so um, he wrote first and second um, Thessalonians. 
And then while he's on his third missionary journey, he writes first and second Corinthians. First Corinthians is a huge spanking book um, mm -hmm. where he basically is admonishing them on all the stuff that's going on. And then remember second Corinthians, we read a lot of that in our lesson that he talks about how much he loves that church in Corinth. Um, and then because he keeps wanting to get to Rome, he doesn't get to Rome. And because of that, he writes the book of Romans and he's gonna get to Rome, but not in the time that he wanted to. And so he writes the book of Romans. And so um, here we are, we're entering into this time where he's gonna to continue to go on journeys, but they're <laughs> truly not missionary journeys. He's gonna be kind of taken against his will. Um, so we're gonna pick up in Acts 21 verse one, and it says that, and when we had parted from them, meaning those Ephesian elders we talked about last week, and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, which by the way, that is one of the places you go on this whole Greece trip is Rhodes. Not a real biblical important place, but one of my favorites on the trip. Um, just amazing. And from there to Patera, and having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia. So that probably took some time. He's trying to find a ship to hitch a ride on him and his group that he's traveling with, we went aboard and set sail. And so you can tell that Luke is with him. He's using all the we's here, that Luke is currently with him. And we came in sight of Cyprus. So when you were drawing your map, um, you would have him being, in fact, I love Luke's details. He said, if you looked out to the left of the ship, you would see Cyprus and leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria, which is the huge landmass, right? Syria is where Antioch is and Tyre, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And so they're gonna be a while there, unload, unloading that cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and through the Spirit, they were telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem. When our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And I love the image this gives us. It's such a visual, isn't it? And they all, including their wives and children, accompanied us until we were outside the city and kneeling down on the beach we prayed and said farewell to one another. That must have been super meaningful to Luke for him to give us this many details about it. And then we went aboard the ship and they returned home. And when we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we landed in Ptolemus, I guess, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and finally came to Caesarea. And if you remember, we left Philip the Evangelist in Caesarea. Now, just to remind you, Philip the Evangelist was one of the seven with Stephen. If you remember, they were the seven men who, if you did Acts 1, this should all sound very familiar to you. They were the seven men that they basically asked to be deacons these men of spirits that were going to be serving the widows, if you remember what the problem was. And then those, um, Stephen in particular, was healing people and preaching, and Stephen, they stoned. And at the stoning of Stephen is when all the Jews really began to persecute that early church in Jerusalem, and they all left. And do you remember, where did Philip end up? Anybody remember? was the first half-breeds really to be reached. Samaria. Samaria, that's exactly right. Philip ended up in Samaria, don't you remember? And the gospel just does what the gospel does and people are coming to know Jesus. And then Peter has to come down to make sure that it's all kosher what's going on and they receive the Holy Spirit. This is all sounding familiar from a long time ago. And then remember Philip is 
in this great situation where God's doing amazing thing and God pulls him up and puts him out in the desert. Do you remember why? Who was he supposed to meet? The Ethiopian eunuch who was traveling. And Philip shares Christ with this Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch goes on. And Philip, from that point, drops down to the coast. And he said that he went to a few places, and then he ended up at Caesarea. So Philip is probably the leader in Caesarea of the church. Keep that in mind, because Paul's going to end up back in Caesarea in a few verses. But think about this, that Philip is living pretty peacefully, as far as we know, in Caesarea, and it isn't a problem. Remember, it's only a problem for the Romans at this point if they start making commotion. As long as they're keeping the peace, they don't care what God you worship. They just want to keep the peace because really all they're worried about is their job. <laughs> they're worried that they're going to get fired for not being able to keep the peace in the area that they have been given to take care of. So we're going to see that happen with this tribune. Um, and so we see that Philip, I love these details, that Philip was one of the seven and they stayed with him and he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. That's all we know, right? Um, four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Does he sound familiar at all to you? Agabus, go all the way back to chapter 5, and if you remember, in chapter 5, you're like, I don't remember. <laughs> well, I'm going to remind you. Um, in chapter 5 is where, am I, am I in the right place? Hold on. No, chapter 5 is somewhere else we're going. Where is little Agapus? Oh, it's on the slide. Somebody tell me it's on the slide. 1128. I'm sorry. We are going to go back to chapter 5 for something else. But 1128, if you remember, this is when Barnabas went from Jerusalem to Antioch. And why did they send Barnabas to Antioch? Yeah, to check out, close, to check out what's going on up there. They're getting word that Gentiles are accepting Jesus. And so Peter and James and the church send Barnabas, the encourager, to go check it out. But you're exactly right. Once he gets there and he sees what's happening and he remembers, hey, Paul's just right next door at Tarsus, he goes and he gets Paul from Tarsus and brings Paul to Antioch. And that's where that becomes their launching place for all their missionary journeys is from Antioch. And so we have Paul and Barnabas are in Antioch and look who comes. Now, verse 27, now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So the prophets went from Jerusalem up to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the day of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. So they're taking up really this first big love offering there in Antioch, we've talked many times about how all of these churches would have been better off than the Jerusalem churches. The Jerusalem churches are the most persecuted at this time in history because the only people who really care about them are these Jews, are the fellow Jews. So the Jerusalem church is the one that's suffering the most. And so look what they did. They took up an offering and sent it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Paul. So this is one of um, Paul's trips into Jerusalem was to bring this offering of money. It's okay. 
that makes me feel like I need to wake up because that's my alarm in the morning. Um, all right, so that is who Agabus is, and Agabus is a pro prophet, and he comes from Judea, from that very Jerusalem area. And yes, he's a prophet, but it probably doesn't take much profiting. I know that's not a word. <laughs> to, to come up with this idea that Paul doesn't need to go to Jerusalem. And so he comes to um, Paul and he takes Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentile. He's using a good old word picture, isn't he? And when we heard this, look at what Luke says. When I heard this, we and the people there urged him to not go to Jerusalem. So even Luke thought, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul answered and said, what are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem. For the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, Let the will of the Lord be done. And indeed, the will of the Lord is going to be done. We're going to just see how beautifully he orchestrates this um, and uses Paul's own intelligence and um, creative thinking um, to even say the right things at the right time. Um, and so we have that these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Poor Luke is probably like, you know, it would really help me if you didn't go to Jerusalem because it puts me in a lot less danger as well. But some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasin of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers, so the other disciples there, um, received us gladly. And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. So now the church in general welcomed him, but he's gonna go to James. And I think this is so interesting because it gives us a picture of what was really going on in that Jerusalem church. And by the way, I don't want to ruin the fun for you, but when we get to Galatians, there's this whole disagreement that Paul and Peter have because Peter basically is eating with the Gentiles, hanging out with the Gentiles in the Galatia area when he's in town. But when some of these Judaizers come into town, Peter's going to pull away from the Gentiles. And we're going to read this when we get to the book of Galatians. And Paul's going to admonish him for it and say, you know, you should not be pulling away from those Gentiles. You're sick. So Peter and James, I wish we had another book for them that tells us what's really going on in that Jerusalem church because they're really having a hard time and you can tell by what they tell Paul to do here and Paul humbly does it now some of us would be like I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to compromise my convictions but it's interesting that Paul follows the leadership here of James and so Paul went into James, and after greeting them, he related one by one the things God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. So he's talking about that here in this area, Paul, there are thousands of of Jews who have become believers and yet they're still zealous for the law now that probably gave you pause because Paul's whole message is as a saved Jew 
to not be zealous for the law. But we're going to see that here in Jerusalem, even among the Christians, and James tells us that they're believers, they are still zealous for the law, meaning they're still keeping a lot of the rituals. Um, they're still going into the temple. They're still keeping a lot of that stuff. Now, Paul hasn't thrown it all away, has he? Like we saw what something Paul did that he didn't have to do. It's kind of part of the whole Judaism thing. So you may remember? Okay, circumcised Timothy. That's a great answer. Not the one I was thinking, but you're absolutely right. Yes, he always goes to the synagogue when he's supposed to. Absolutely, the Nazarite vow. Do you remember the Nazarite vow? The Nazarite vow is something that we read about some in Numbers 6. And this Nazarite vow was a way of setting yourself apart. And we do that kind of thing. Many of us will do a fasting from things or a time of separation um, for spiritual reasons. And so this Paul had done the Nazarite vow and um, had shaved his head um, during that whole third missionary journey. And so I love what these uh, James is pretty wise here. He says, get around some good company. Like get around some guys who are also doing the Nazarite vow because it's going to make you look good if this is who you're hanging out with. Does that make sense? And this is literally what James is doing here. He's saying, let you need to be seen with these three men, four men. So look at what it says. It says, um, they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told, I'm in verse 21, they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Now that's not really true, but that's probably how they felt it. That's how they felt it. Even the Christians probably felt like Paul went too far. And boy, we get, I, I don't know about you, sometimes I, I can be judgy, <laughs> right? That a certain music style or a certain this or a certain that is just over the top, too much, right? And that's what they're thinking about Paul telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. Now that much is true, that Paul is saying you don't need to be circumcised or walk according to our customs for salvation. But they're going to have a problem with it. And verse 22, they, they say, what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. It's going to spread fast. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow, that same Nazarite vow. Take these men, purify yourself al along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their head. Thus, all will know that there is something in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance to the law or of the law but as for the gentile and so they're basically saying paul for your own safety here we need you to play along by their rules and it would be very similar to us going somewhere where they believe that christians should cover their heads and out of respect for what they're doing we would cover our head before going in. Now, we know we don't have to have our head covered, um, but we're, we feel free to not do it, but out of respect and out of a way to influence the people, we would maybe cover our head. So this is, that's just kind of a, just an example. But they do say this, it's funny, they want us to make sure, and Luke wants us to make sure that, but as for the Gentiles who have believed, we sent a letter with our judgment. Well, we know that. That happened back in chapter, what, 15? 
the Jerusalem Council. We, we know this, but just James wants to make sure, even though we're asking Paul to do this, we want to be clear, this is not what we're asking for the Gentiles, that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. And we talked about this, the, the Jerusalem Council gave those parameters to the Gentiles for unity in the churches of the day, that the Jews wouldn't even be able to cope with them being served meat that was from the temple. So as they're having fellowship with one another and how they're having to live together, the Jerusalem elders sent this letter saying, this is how you Gentiles need to live to get along with the Jews. And so verse 26, I, really, Paul could have said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm proud of my message, right? But that Paul humbles himself. It says Paul took the men and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. And so he is um, giving them, um, going in with them, and the, the seven days, the days of purification, you would make note, you would tell the temple, my seven days have started, and you would go into the temple on the third day, and then you'd go into the temple on the sixth day. And is this sixth day, um, verse 27, when the seven days were almost completed, because it's the sixth day of this seven days, the Jews from Asia Minor, guess who's come? The Jews from the Ephesus area, that Asia Minor area, have come down to Jerusalem. They've traveled all this way. Seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Now that's a lie. He's not teaching him against Jerusalem, against the Jews. But this is what the Asia Minor um, Jews are saying about him. And then they're going to even blame him for bringing a Greek into the temple. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place where they had previously seen, previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian. Well, where is Ephesus? Asia Minor. So they would have known this character, this Greek, um, Trophimus. They're like, we know who he is. And we saw Paul walking around with him and assumed that he must have um, brought him into the temple and he said and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple then all the city was stirred up and people ran together I love Luke's way of saying that everybody started again my mom would say birds of the feather flock together right mm -hmm. and when a couple people get upset it's so easy for everybody to get upset and they seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So on your little map, you looked at this. This is, um, it was on page 75, if you didn't get a chance to do your lesson. Um, And so this is just a picture of um, what the temple would have looked like in that day. And do you see all the way on that left-hand side, do you see the Antonia Fortress? They would have taken him out that gate. And so the um, tribune, who we're going to find out his name is Claudius, in a couple more verses. So Claudius from that Antonia fortress can see this big mob and riot happening and the cohort came and told him, I'm sorry, he's the tribune of the cohort. 
And so this tribune, this Claudius, is basically put into place as the Roman watch eye to keep Jerusalem settled. And he reports to Felix. So, and Felix is the governor of the whole Judea. And then Felix has his people in each one of the cities, in each one of the main cities. And this tribune, whose name is Claudius, is um, the tribune of that area. And so he, seeing what's going on, he at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So can you see the scene literally happening in the street? They're beating Paul and down comes running the Roman soldiers and the tribune. And the tribune came up and arrested Paul and ordered him to be bound with two chains because the tribune's thinking, well, whatever you've done, it must be terrible that all these people want to kill you and that they're beating you. And what I find almost comical for the next, you know, chapter really is the tribune, this Claudius is still trying to figure out what in the world this man's done. Because he does not understand why these Jews are so angry with him and why they want to kill him. And so he, he just assumes that he must have done something terrible. So he binds them and he, in, he inquired who he was and what he had done. And even we're going to see in a minute, he even is confused of whether he's this Egyptian man that's been causing trouble. And so... Some in the crowd, you can just see the scene, can't you? Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. Now, it was interesting there. I did not know whether that he is the tribune or Paul. And I have no answer for you. I just know it was a very chaotic scene. It almost seems like that is the tribune, that it's so chaotic that he can't even make it up his own steps. Um, and the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? Are you not, because obviously when Paul said to him, may I say something to you? He spoke in Greek to him. Yeah. And, and we're gonna see here, it's important that Paul speaks the language um, that would most affect what Paul needs to happen in this situation. So he speaks Greek to him, and so the guy says, hey, if you know Greek, are you the Egyptian who recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? And Paul's like, because in this guy's mind, in Claudius's mind, that would make sense that they want to kill him if he did that. And Paul says, no, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. Now, he doesn't tell him yet he's a Roman citizen, but he gives him enough of the credentials to make Claudius think twice about what he's going to do with Paul. And so Paul says, I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when they had given him permission... Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people, and there was a great hush, and he addressed them in the Hebrew language. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And I'm going to read this kind of quick because none of this should seem new to you. We studied this chapter in pretty good detail when we studied the Damascus Road experience. 
he says, and when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gav Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law and of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. And as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom you are persecuting. Now those who were there with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one, Ananias, we're going to see another Ananias pop up here in a minute, but this is the good Ananias, another common name, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there. He came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will to see the righteous one whom he just saw, right? He just saw the righteous man on the road and to hear a voice from his mouth, Jesus speaking to him. For you will be a witness for Jesus to everyone of what you've seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. And when I returned to Jerusalem um, and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. So now um, Paul has fast forwarded. We know he was in Damascus, then he went down to Arabia for three years, went back to Damascus, they lowered him down on that basket, and now he's traveled to Jerusalem the first time as a Christian. And he tells us he has this um, vision um, in the temple of Jesus himself coming to him and says, these people here will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments who killed him. And Jesus said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And so Paul gets to this point where he says, they will know me. I'm the one who was persecuting you and persecuting your Christians. And I was even there and approved of them stoning Stephen. But he says that Jesus tells him to go to the Gentiles. And so that final word, the final insult that Jesus was for the Gentiles and raged them, verse 22, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, Bless you. for he should not be allowed to live. And, can, and 
I can just see Claudius going, what? Like, he still does not understand. And as they were shouting, and look at just every Jewish way of showing great emotion, the ripping of their clothes, the ripping their coats off, they're throwing dirt up in the air, just showing their complete disgust with what Paul has said. So the tribune orders him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. He still does not understand. And he's thinking, there has to be more to the story. I'm going to flog him and find out the real reason why they want to kill Paul. And so Paul knows. He's already been beaten by the Jews and everything. He may not even live through this flogging. And so as that point comes, Paul's going to do something very intelligent. And so when they stretched him out for the whips, um, in fact, the tribune's not even right here, right? They're, he just, the tribune says, just take him, flog him, and find out, like find out the real story about this guy. And so they stretch him out for the whips. Paul looks over at the centurion who was standing by. Is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Because he hasn't broken a Roman law. He hasn't done anything. And the answer to that question is no, it is not legal for them to do that. So when the centurion heard this, he goes to the tribune and he says to him, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. And then the tribune answered, kind of a smart answer. I bought this citizenship for a large sum. I think he's asking Paul that. He's not saying he bought the Roman citizenship. He's saying, did you buy the Romans? Are you saying I bought the Roman citizenship with a large sum? And Paul says, no, no, I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune was also afraid. Can you see this? Can you see the scene? Paul's getting ready to be whipped. He says that and all the soldiers are like, I'm not going to touch him. And the tribune is immediately afraid for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had illegally bound him. And on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. So basically, they're at the same place that they were 24 hours ago, right? When the huge crowd is there. But now the crowd is dissipated and the tribune is still scratching his head wondering why they want to kill him. So he calls the chief priests and the elders to come and let's have this conversation. And so this next thing is all happening in front of the tribune, in front of this Claudius. And so Paul has another opportunity and he looks intently at the council and he says, brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Now, if you remember, Peter said something very similar to this. When Peter was asked to be quiet about the gospel, he said, who should I obey? God or man? Do you remember that? And he put them kind of in this bad position because who are they to say that he shouldn't obey God? And by the way, there are some Pharisees, we're going to read about them in a minute, who are listening to this, and we've seen this before too with Gamaliel. There are some Pharisees listening to him say this, and it's they're thinking, what if? Peace. Go ahead, Mary. Well, I was just going to say, this is so similar to Jesus. Yeah. You know, and then Pilate scratching his head. Like, mm -hmm. what? 100%. Yeah. 
because they don't care who you worship. They just want to keep the peace. But it was the Jews who killed Jesus, and it's the Jews who are after Paul, absolutely, for the same reasons, right? And they're both doing it illegally, just like they did with Jesus. Hundred percent. Against the Roman law and against the Jewish law. Absolutely, yeah. And um, and so Paul is basically saying, "Listen, I've done what God's asked me to do," and that just makes the high priest furious. <laughs> the high priest. Um, and they, why can I not say that word now? And they, Ananias, thank you, just lost it, commanded those who stood by him to strike him in the mouth, illegally, by the way. And Paul said to him, now this is interesting, Luke does not judge. Um, he writes the facts. So I'm not real sure how I feel about this whole exchange that's about to take place, and I'm not the only one. I did read some commentaries on this one because I'm like, is Paul mad? Is he smarting off? Like, what's going on here? And I'll give you some of the choices I saw. But Paul says to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. And if you remember, Jesus had looked at the Pharisees before and called them whitewashed tombs. And now Paul is calling them white, calling this particular high priest a whitewashed wall. And he says, are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you ordered me to be struck. Nobody knew the law better than Paul. And he's saying, you're persecuting me for breaking the law, and you just broke the law. Um, which makes you a hypocrite. Yes, which makes you a hypocrite. I, I, by the way, I just can't help but remember, can't help that that rings bells of like when um, my children have done things that are wrong, and as I'm correcting them, I get too angry about it. And then your kids point out that you're really sinning by being so angry. <laughs> that's what it sounded like to me. And that's what Paul did. And those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? So Paul is speaking bad to the high priest. Now, this is what's fascinating to me, and I don't know the answer. Because Paul says something very strange next. Paul said... I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. Correct. Correct. And that's one of the choices. Um, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So did anybody put a question mark by this statement? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with what Paul says? He would have, surely he would have known by what he was wearing. We would think. Now. That's such a great point. But they, they got together quickly. Quickly, so you didn't have time. They got together quickly in front of the steps at Claudius's house, and he wasn't maybe dressed like the high priest. And Paul may not know who the current high priest is. He's been gone a while. So that is one of the possibilities, absolutely. Good pickup there. Um, another one is that this really is a sarcastic statement. That he's saying, oh, like Mary said, oh, well, I didn't know you were the high priest. You're certainly not acting like one, right? And um, then does state for all the other Pharisees to hear, I do know what the law says. Does this man know the law? <laughs> so it could be an ironic, sarcastic statement. And there is one other thing, too, is that the um, whole thing going back to many people believe Paul had really bad eyesight. So he also may not have physically known. Those are all your choices. Could be some combination of them. We'll have to ask them one day when we get to heaven. But here's where Paul's great intelligence. He decides what I'm going to do. Reminds me again of my kids. I'm going to pit one parent against the other parent. Your kids ever do this to you, right? Um, 
And so that's what he does. He knows, he knows these Pharisees and Sadducees so well. He knows what's going to trip them up. So he says, and by the end of this conversation, he gets the Pharisees standing up for him. Um, and so, he, so what he did worked. So Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees. And he cried out in the council. Again, this is all happening in the steps. But as Paul looks out at the crowd, based on how they're dressed and based on who he knows, it's interesting that Gamaliel could be here. The rabbi he followed. Now, Gamaliel was a Pharisee. It's so interesting. I was reading this thought that a Pharisee could become a Christian without losing all of their pharisaical things. A Sadducee could not become a Christian and still be a Sadducee. Well, interesting there. Because the Pharisees, their love for the law could still halfway be compatible with Jesus. But the Sadducees didn't believe in any afterlife, any resurrection, anything after. And so Paul is going to play on that by bringing out the differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he, and he says, brothers, I am a Pharisee. And it's interesting that he doesn't say, I used to be a Pharisee. You know, he says, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. And it is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. Here's the thing. All good Pharisees had a hope of a resurrection. That, <coughs> what he said right there is absolutely true. That every good Pharisee is like, right, it is part of our teaching that we would have a hope of a resurrection. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. And Luke tells us exactly why. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And then a great clamor arose, and I just picture Claudius looking at him like, y'all are nuts, like, <laughs> right? Because Claudius is like, now they're fighting among themselves, and he's a witness to all of this. This great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong in this man. What if it was a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And if you remember, go back, this is where we're going back, to all the way to Acts 5. And just this is where this idea is coming from. And maybe Paul even knew um, this. All the way back in Acts 5, we see that um, verse 34 this is when Peter and James um, are there, in, again, in front of the council, and they want to um, kill them. They want to just kill them in verse 33. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, who we've talked about so many times, that Paul, 98% sure that he is here when this is happening. And he's a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people. He stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he gives this whole reasoning that, listen, these Messiah people, they pop up regularly and they just go away. So let's leave them alone because either that's what's gonna happen, it's gonna die out, or look, verse 38, um, so in the present, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan 
or this undertaking is of man, it'll fail. But if it is of God, he's leaving the door open. If it is of God, you won't be able to overthrow him anyhow. You might even be found opposing God. So this is where this whole idea comes from that Paul could have even thought, hey, I remember Gamaliel gave in and let Peter and James go with this idea. If I can give them just the littlest inclination that this really is the spirit of God and this or an angel. And of course, the Sadducees are just outraged because they don't believe in any of it. But the Pharisees are not willing um, to rule out that it wasn't possible that a spirit or angel spoke to him. Is that not fascinating to you, making that connection? Um, and that Paul could have come up with that whole thing standing right there, thinking, I'm going, to, I'm going to play the whole thing that happened with Gamaliel. I know these Pharisees. I know them. I'm, I am one of them. And I know they have a little door open for hope. And so he's going to appeal to that. So interesting. And so when the dissension became violent, the tribune afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down the steps and to take him away from among them by force to bring him into the barracks. And I love this. Obviously, Paul needed it. That the following night, the Lord stood by him. Jesus himself comes and stands with Paul and says, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Telling, not only does he give them hope, but he stands with them and gives them courage and says, This is not over. You're going to make it to Rome. And when it was day, the Jews, I'm probably not on the right slide at all. I waited so long, it went off. I'm on it? Okay. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. This is how passionate they are about it, that they are like, we are not going to even, they're going on a death strike, basically. We're not going to eat or drink till we've killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. And they went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now remember, these are the same chief priests and elders the day before who were fighting among themselves. And so these 40 men are going to now put pressure on those elders um, and chief priests by saying, we're going to all kill ourselves until we get Paul dead. And so they're going to try to yield the influence of that. Now, therefore, you, along with all the council, Give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you, as though you are going to determine his case more exactly. And you know Claudius would go along with that, right? Because all Claudius wants to figure out is why are they? <laughs> like, what is his problem? Um, and we and we'll be waiting. We are ready to kill him when he comes near. And now the son of Paul's sister, so Paul's nephew, who some say may be in, a, he, he may be a Pharisee himself, in the temple, hears of this plan um, and 
he went and entered into the barracks and told Paul. So you can see that Paul's not, not under the strictest. He's allowed visitors. Paul called into one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune for he has something to say. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And again, you can see that God is using so many circumstances that this nephew is courageous enough. He's putting his life on the line for his uncle Paul. And he may not even be sure um, about everything about what Uncle Paul's saying, but he knows that he can't be responsible for his death, so he goes and speaks to the tribune. And verse 20, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though you were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him, who are bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you've informed me of these things. And he immediately goes through a plan that he's got to get Paul out of town quickly. So he called two centurions and he got ready, tells them to get ready 200 soldiers and 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. So before the next day could even come and the Jews can come to him, um, many have said that this was probably the Sabbath that this was taking place on and that's why um, Paul that they knew the Jews weren't going to move on Paul that day. They were waiting for tomorrow to bring Paul to the council. And so, um, again, Claudius doesn't see. It's so interesting. You kind of wonder if the Holy Spirit's really pricking his heart. We don't get to see what happens. But he knows I need to get Paul out of here. He's a Roman citizen. So he puts, what, 470 people of his army to deliver one man on horseback and to bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote the letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued them. It's a, that's half true, right? <laughs> Having learned that he was a Roman citizen and desiring to know the charge for which they're accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment and when it was disclosed to me that there was a plot against the man I sent him to you at once ordering his accusers also to state before you what they've done what they have against him so um, Claudius is basically moving this whole thing out of his city to keep the peace and he's going to send Paul to Felix and then he's going to tell the council and the high priest you all need to go to Felix as well and have your whole thing there. I want you out of my city. I don't want to be responsible for what's going to happen. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Anapatris. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting just those 70 horsemen go on with them. Because now they're in Samaritan land, they're in an area where they don't need the 400 extra soldiers. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. So this is Felix asking Paul where you're from. And when he learned that it, he was from Cilicia, and this is why he's asking that, is Felix is only qualified 
to judge, if you look at this map, he is in charge of Syria and Cilicia are the two areas that he's in Judea. That's the area he's in charge of. So let's say Paul had been from Ephesus, Felix would not be able to rule on that. He would have probably forwarded him on. But because he is from Cilicia, he said, I'll give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod, Herod's praetorium. And we're going to see um, that the um, high priests are indeed going to come down and they're going to open up this ability for Paul to be able to share there again his story and speak um, then again. Um, I was in Publix the other day and um, I had done an online order and I never do online orders but I'd come in from the woman's retreat and frankly I was too tired to go to the grocery store yeah. on the Sunday following and so and I, I wanted very specific things that I knew none of the men in my home were able to detail enough right <laughs> So I did a, you know, Instacart. Of course, they didn't get every. This shows how lacking details they are. That they didn't even get everything from the Instacart order. Some of it got left in Publix, and um, so I went over the next day on that Monday, and I walked straight into the customer service um, area, and there was a man there um, who had a mask on, um, and he was literally shaking. He was so afraid. He obviously has some kind of anxiety disorder of some kind. And it was this real awkward setup where he had his cart, and I had a cart, because I was going to get a couple other things when I was there. And um, he had, like, I, I, I wanted to make sure I hadn't lodged him close to the customer service desk. So I'm trying to move my cart. I'm like, go ahead, go ahead. He, and he said, I can't walk. I can't walk. And I said, okay. Um, and I'm looking at the lady behind the thing, and she's like, and he's, so he's like just staring at the door and at, the, at this Publix. It's the entrance door. And I hear the lady behind saying, sir, you can use the exit sir you can use the exit and he would look over there and he was so frightened of the exit so he looks at me and he says he says if you leave the store i'll be able to leave the store and i said so you just want me to walk out that door and then you'll walk out that door and he said yes so i'm like okay so i walk out the door and then i wait outside the store and he doesn't come so I go back in the exit door, because I, I, I want to help the poor man. And I come back in the exit door, and he's literally staring. And I think the problem of it was, I think he was afraid of germs. And I think he was afraid that there was too much traffic on that entrance door. And he couldn't walk out it with people being coming in, I think but that he didn't want to go the exit door either. So I've come back in the exit door and I'm just kind of looking at him. And y'all, it was just the most pitiful thing. I mean, he just was shaking. He was so afraid to just walk out the door. And, um, and so I, I, I stood away from him because I realized I was part of the problem. And finally it got less busy people coming in and he took off that door and went out and you know I never saw him again but I went over to the lady at the counter and she's like ma'am I am so sorry I'm like no no it's okay it's not your fault she said well he wanted me to leave the store too but I I can't leave the store I'm behind the desk you know but he wanted her to leave too and I just it just hit me <laughs> that um, 
his inability to be able to just take that next step because of how anxious he was. And, um, and I started thinking about, I know many of you are gonna be like, you're starting to think too much like your husband. Um, I just started thinking about how sometimes I get afraid to take that next step or to do that next thing that God asks me to do. And I think it's so interesting that he asked me to go through that door first and then he would go through the door because sometimes it helps when you see somebody else do something and they don't die, right? <laughs> that maybe you can do the same thing, right? Um, I still wouldn't jump out of an airplane. Yes, and that's such a good example of if somebody, if you go skydiving, um, which I haven't done, I think I could do it now. Because if I die, it's fine. Like my kids are all raised. Oh. But <laughs> when they when they were little, I didn't want to do it because I was just worried about leaving my kids. But um, they, um, I that's such a great example. If one person jumps out of the plane, you think, well, I can do it too, but it didn't work with you. I would never even consider doing it. Oh, you didn't even go up in the no, plane. No, no, no. Has anybody in here skydived? Paragliding? Oh, that's even more dangerous, I think. <laughs> but he did it. Yeah. Um, but as I was getting to this verse where Jesus comes to Paul and stands beside him um, and he says to him take courage there are a couple more steps you need to take there's a couple more doors you need to go through and take courage because I'm not done with you yet and and that's the thing is that really as I grow um, there was this really weird thing that happened that I was a, like had no safety measures at all before I became a Christian. I would jump off bridges and down in South Florida, drive way too far, fast in cars, like as fast as a car would go down a highway. Um, just reckless life. But when I got saved, all of a sudden, I started really being more cautious. I didn't want to die, which that doesn't make any sense, right? Because now I get to go to heaven, right? So, like, why would I? But all of a sudden, life meant something. Mm -hmm. I had a life to live, and I was excited about the abundant life that God had for me. I bought into the abundant life, and I'm so glad I did because it's been greatly abundant. Um and then, of course, you have kids, and your fear factor goes up. Um, it shouldn't. You should still be able to hold your life with open hands. But um, I haven't always done that well. But I think I could go skydiving now. Because, really, am I done testifying? Is God done with me? And if he is done with me, I could have a brain aneurysm or be hit by a car. Is he done with me or not done with me? I mean, really, I'm not saying, I'm not saying be stupid, but I'm just saying hold on loosely because either God has more testifying for you to do or he doesn't. <laughs> and like Paul, Jesus wants to stand beside us and say, take courage. I know how many years you have left. And some of us are so fearful about everything. And um, I just wanted to encourage you that to not see Paul as this um, hero that isn't human. We've seen him all the way through. We've seen his humanity. And that each one of us, like Paul, have the ability to testify and be a witness for him. 
and God has our days numbered. And I don't want to live my life shaking, staring at doors, um, afraid. And it just really hit me that so many people are living your life like that. That was such an obvious representation. Bless his heart. I mean, you could just, he needs medicine or he needs Jesus and medicine both because he was just, um, but I thought, um, I just don't want to be that person that's so afraid of whatever God wants next of me. And I mean, I even, it's like very practical for me because we're looking at doing <clears throat> a Kenya trip in September and I'm not afraid to go to Kenya I've been before but there's particular things we're gonna be doing on the trip that make me a little nervous and we're not with a big team it's just David and I traveling around Nairobi and all of that really makes me pretty nervous some of you are now nervous for me um, <laughs> but I really feel like God's called us to do this and um, I'm definitely the safety one between the two of us and it just really ministered to me that Jesus is with me and that um, I testify here about him and that if he wants me to testify in the future, he's going to, he has the ability to be right here with me and knows my days. So I just want that to be an encouragement for you all. Um, we serve a God who knows the number of the hairs on our head. He knows us so intimately and he knows what you're afraid of and he knows what he has, the work and plans that he has for you. And that's why that verse, you know, I always say, don't say that to somebody, you know, that God, um, oh my goodness, um, forgot, oh my goodness, tell me the verse. God has the plans for you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah lost it in my brain um, that you know right after somebody suffered something extreme that is not what you want to come and tell right Jane that's not what you wanted someone to come tell you right after Barry passed away right but now you preached it to yourself yeah. and you you preach it to yourself and you know that that's true I and still wouldn't jump out of an airplane <laughs> you and I maybe. I had piloted an airplane I would do that again but I wouldn't yeah. jump out of one Me, I, you know even those little airplanes that I've been on in Kenya before is when I've been on them you should see me I am like like this but I keep thinking if God's going to let me die on a mission trip this is how I want to die <laughs> this is how I want to die is on mission for Jesus and um, so, yeah, I, I don't know about me jumping out either. I can barely get on a little plane, much less jump out of it. So I'm preaching to the choir. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> God, we want to trust you. And for all of us, it's not going to be by jumping out of an airplane. <laughs> God, it may just be opening our mouth um, to our neighbor and talking about you to them testifying and witnessing. God, I thank you that um, you're not done with us yet. And God, whether we're 80 or 20, um, God, you have us here for a purpose. And that you want to use everything that's gone on in our lives um, for your glory and to testify about you. God, let us just have open hands on our life, the things we love, our family. God, may we just lean more into trusting you, knowing that you stand next to us and say, take courage. God, we have a high priest who is always with us, is even able to pray for us when we don't know how to pray. And God, we know that you're capable of ministering to us in the details. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.